Summer. 2016. I just completed my terribly forgettable years of middle school after five consecutive years of bullying in elementary school for being the only kid who wouldn't shut the fuck up about Power Rangers and Beyblade. It was my last summer before a new chapter of my life, that being obviously high school, and with that came a lot of new things in my life as new chapters often come with. Along with cultural phenomena such as a silent voice, your name, and Kanye's life of Pablo, came something that kinda changed my perception of reality, and most definitely made me more gay as I kept watching. Of course seeing the title, you know I'm talking about fucking Voltron. Like, it's pretty obvious. Voltron Legendary Defender is another iteration of the titular ongoing franchise about five paladins on a mission to defend the universe from the evil Goron Space Empire, this time created under DreamWorks, that premiered in the summer of 2016, being one of the big hitters in a new movement of the Netflix original shows and movies. When it was announced, niggas were mad hype. Niggas being me considering I made a video on it right when the trailer came out. I still remember the good old days like that when times were simple, and the biggest thing people had to worry about was whatever drama came out of the next Leafy video, and not like, a glow pandemic. No fucking graduation for me. I was finna have my beach episode, but that shit finna be in the tub at this rate. Though back to a more nostalgic time, as soon as Voltron came out, there was an instant success and an instant boom. A huge factor that probably contributed to success was the fact that the show was animated by Studio Mer, which was responsible for many notable anime-like western shows such as the Avatar sequel Legend of Korra and the Boondocks. So what I'm saying is, it's anime. I mean, it's not, but it is, but it isn't, but it kinda is. And as you know, super stylized shows like this typically do well. So super stylized anime like shows do super well for a multitude of reasons, if you're calling cute boys reasons. Seriously though, this show brought a fresh and nuanced experience to the already pretty established franchise at a perfect time when Voltron wasn't really in the limelight. It was really nice for me though seeing as I was already a big fan of Voltron and enjoyed anime like western shows such as VLD. So it sounds perfect right? Or at least near perfection. But if you're unfamiliar with the series, you're probably asking me where's the part where like everything goes wrong, seeing as you've seen the title of the video. I mean this sounds like an absolute perfectly described adventure with perfect wholesome boys nothing could have gone wrong right right i mean if you're a voltron fan you already know what happened crash and burn crash and burn you were so close to the finish line like so fucking close Sadly, you niggas know that Voltron turned from a massive success story to somehow a massive dumpster fire in a matter of literally just a season, or two arguably. I mean, it was heartbreaking to hear. I was on the edge of my seat with whatever next season trailer was released and so was everyone else. There by any means wasn't really a decline, and more of a cementation into place as a regular, mostly respectful fandom. Which means everyone tuned into what was seemingly such a massive disappointment. But what really breaks my gay little heart is the fact that because of the shitty ending, people chalk up the whole show as a shit show. When it's simply obviously isn't the case. But it is the purpose of today's oh so special video. Since it seems that a lot of you have forgotten about the good in the show, me included, as your resident sad Voltron expert in clan stand, I'm gonna go through the show and discuss its many highs and eventual lows to remind you folk just how not ass the show was before like, all that happened. Yeah, this may be an excuse for me to rewatch Voltron and fall in love with Clance again with the purpose, but so what if it is? It's gonna be fucking fun, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> When looking back at episode 1 of Voltron, you can already vividly see all the characterization put in right then and there. You already understand that Lance is the overconfident but headstrong moron who means well but gets into goofy trouble. Hunk is the big and lovable but very smart scaredy cat. Pidge is the smart and witty but first somewhat reserved one. While Keith has almost no relation to any of them except for Lance who he fails to recognize as a rival of any kind. And in all honesty... <laughs> At least here, I think that's fair. What we learn about Keith is only from what this commander guy says about him, which is that he flunked out and has behavioral issues, and that Lance obviously doesn't like him and sees their relationship as a rivalry. Which, like I said, Keith does not see. Like, at all. Keith's only link here is to Shiro, and although we don't exactly know how far that goes, one can only assume they have some pre-established history seeing as Shiro doesn't know any of these niggas except for Keith. Looking back, this is a really good first episode seeing all of them stumble together and form a makeshift team find an alliance in oddly convenient ways. I mean, you're telling me that no one else saw the green line here in this big temple. Like, no one randomly stumbled upon it or the line carvings leading to it. I can say the same for the yellow line. You're telling me nobody decided to use the drill right in the cave. Sure, the planet might have nobody on it, but it's been 10,000 years since the lines were sent off as told to us via Altair and Exposition. I can kind of let it slide on Earth because niggas are dumb and in general because of destiny and a prophecy or whatever, but it seems a little too convenient. Like, the so-called Galwin Empire was 
was smart enough to take over galaxies but not find a few lions, by chance even, for 10,000 years. That's some good luck, but I digress. Seeing the Paladins form their admittedly better than they think team in the short time they had was actually really cool. And even if this was an hour long episode, it somehow feels faster paced than normal. Though that may be due to all the information fed to us and the fact that a lot happens in a little over an hour. Like Alora learning that her planet got fucking nuked and she's been asleep for 10,000 years. And you know, grieving for a bit? to only get up and fight. It's not terribly executed or anything, but I just remember it being not as fast, I guess. What always perplexed me is that we barely got to see life on a garrison on Earth, and I kinda wanted to see more of that. But besides my little nitpicks, this was a near perfect and great opener to Voltron. And it gets even better after this. All right, I finished episode one, which is an hour long, and I know damn well that if I, can conti if I continue now, I'm gonna fall asleep. It's like 5 a.m., I have to go to the bank tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not doing that shit. Right off the bat, season one's fucking great. With it being the first season, naturally it's about the team learning more about each other and being able to work as well a team because they're kind of shit. <laughs> We learn important stuff such as seeing planets with other inhabitants and other races of people figuring out just how much of an effect the Goran Empire has had on the universe. And we soon find out that the lions have their own abilities that make them different and useful in different ways. We also hear about Shiro basically having to fight his way out the gulag and being experimented on for the time he was in prison which gives him some form of definite trauma. We also learn that Pidge is a girl, which surprised me that literally no one on the garrison thought she was her brother. Considering she got her hair cut almost identical to his, same glasses, and the paladins even mistaken take this picture of her and Matt as a picture of Pidge and his girlfriend, which is supposed to trick the audience. So if that's what everyone saw, why didn't anyone on the garrison make that conclusion? Come to think of it, I'm surprised that Shiro didn't recognize Pidge as related to Matt. Like, Pidge had to tell him. But they look literally almost identical. And he remembers his crewmates, he just forgets most of his time there. I wish I knew, but I was too busy being distracted by missing all the vibrant colors they use in season 1 compared to the kind of dried out and, and dull, not as fun colors they use in season later on. I hope I'm like not the only person that sees that either. They're all tinted with brighter colors and shading and I guess like like more purple. I guess maybe because in the earlier seasons they were in a different place. I don't know that's how I see it at least. One kind of pointless thing seeing how short lived it was was the Lord being able to talk to a hologram consciousness of her deceased father. Like that sounds like that'd be quite a thing for a while but it only lasted for a few episodes and then she had to destroy his software when it got corrupted due to villain shenanigans which admittedly almost did make me cry. I don't know how they did that. I was that emotionally attached to her father it's like only season one maybe i'm just a crybaby also i forgot one very important thing alora can like shapeshift or at least all altaians can apparently as far as i know this was brought up and used literally only once for her and trust me it isn't a me thing because i asked my best friend who was also in the voltron if he remembers this shit but he does not obviously looking back it's only a setup for the witch bitch and i thought it was magic but i guess it's just altaian biology i guess that's like an l on me so yeah i also know noticed that Pitch added the cloaking stealth thing to her lion, meaning that literally all the lions can be programmed to do this, but no one thought, hey Pitch, can you modify the lions and do this? I mean, maybe she could only do it with her lion, but I, I, I like, I, I doubt it. Speaking of Pitch, there's an episode where she wants to leave and search for her dad and brother and is like, actually, yeah, you know, I, I, I'ma leave. When they all know that Voltron legit cannot be formed without the five of them, specifically, at least for now. I just don't understand, like, how the fuck, like, you, you need five of you. Like, to do the team thing. Like, there's, there's more to consider to just outright leave. Funny thing I also just noticed, but there's a bit of foreshadowing twice that Keith is part Gaura. Once when he hits the Gaura control panel, we're supposed to think it's just a fluke. And when Zarkon tells him that he fights like a Gaura soldier. We're supposed to think it's his own way of complimenting people. And while it might be that, it's also foreshadowing. And in my opinion, pretty clever. Finally, I don't know why, but in the first season, Lance is drawn a lot more, uh attractive in certain frames. This show made me a raging bisexual. It's your fault, Lance McLean. It's your fault. Before I get into the next season, I think it's a good point to express one of the heights that Voltron has when it comes to characterization. There isn't a funny one or a serious one or a perfect one. They're all well-rounded and enjoyable individuals. They're all funny. They all have serious moments and none of them are perfect. Not even the pretty, pretty princess. They're all pretty epic and Keith's kinda dumb. Voltron? But I still love him. Season two abruptly starts off with the whole team being separated. This 
This is because the wormhole jump they tried to complete was being compromised by Witch Bitch. That then brings them every which way to different places. Last season also ended with their first encounter with Zarkon, which they only got out of because of a Galra and a strange outfit taking down all the barrier the Garan soldiers put up. So because of this, we know that this Galra opposed to the regular regime, but we don't exactly know why yet. We soon find out that Zarkon used to be a black paladin, meaning there was a team before this one, so that whole Destiny thing still works, but it's not as suspension of disbelief -y. The first few episodes of the season are dedicated to the paladins having to use their heads, seeing that the Voltron lions aren't exactly in working condition. This includes Pidge building a radio tower to help get Alora and Karan out of a time loop, Lance and Hunk liberating a mind-controlled mermaid alien species that ends up letting them use their beacon for help, and Keith having to connect with the black lion and pilot it to save Shiro. And we learn that Shiro changed Keith's life for the better, but again, we don't exactly know why or how yet. He also tells Keith that in the case that he couldn't make it, he'd want him to lead Voltron. Naturally, they make it, but this does set up the possibility of Keith playing a leading role, which he does later on. As mentioned earlier, some rando did in fact sabotage the Gaura so that they could get out. And in this season, we learn more about the Gauran opposition to, well, the Gauran opposition. This guy is part of a group called the Blades of Mimora, and he saved Shiro from being prisoner in the first place. We also soon find out that because of Zarkon's past bond with the Black Lion, he can track these niggas, which Shiro had to, like, put a stop to. Also, Allura is, like, really racist against Gauran people. Like, it's understandable, like, I guess, but shit, man. I mean, they kinda all are until the guy that saves Shiro before sacrifices himself to save them all from the monster of the week they gotta deal with, but damn. This season honestly amps up the humorous dynamics we see between the team members. Obviously, my favorite moments are for my favorite couple. Look, you stay on one side of the pool, and I'll stay on the other, and we'll be far, far away from each other. Just fucking make out already. But we learned that Shiro and Keith have quite the brotherly relationship and quite the history. That's why I don't like this too much, but I respect all healthy ships. This season also has one of my favorite episode types that are Voltron's really big hitters. The Maul episode, which is more of a lax filler, works well because there is an objective, that being fixing a broken part in the ship, but it also expands on more of the world building and more characterization, which is always pleasurable. Also, we get Kaltenecker. She's an intergalactic treasure. On the other side of the fun, we get more significant plot stuff that happens, such as Keith realizing, like I said earlier, that he's part Gaura from trying to get more answers about his past from the Blades of Mimora. So kind of awkward. One thing that I really don't care for looking back is how heavy handed they treat defeating Zarkon so early on in the show. We got at least six more of these to get through. You can't be acting like this. It's like in Power Rangers when they save the universe one last time and realize that they're not going to be Power Rangers anymore. But it's only been like 26 episodes and we know you've been renewed for another season. Why pretend like we finna believe it's going to be over already? We know just how long that contract y'all got is. This nigga not going anywhere no time soon. Don't get me wrong, it's a really good season finale, but it doesn't feel earned yet. Yet. They've barely explored the universe yet, and they're already acting like they're finna box Fire Lord Ozai. Like, no nigga, give me some more character development, please. Also, Zarkon's out of commission for like a while. I am so gay for this. Oh, um, season three gets a little, um, complicated. This season definitely best demonstrates where the Phantom's opinion of the show changed. I could also say the same about the show itself for longevity's sake. And I only say that after doing personal research and asking you guys exactly what you thought about it. As you guys know, I've been Voltron posting quite a bit because of this very video. And along with regular shit posting, I also seek the opinions from you very beautiful beanbags. Firstly, I asked a very short and simple question. When did Voltron turn bad? As you can see, there are quite the responses. After asking such a polarizing question, naturally I sat there and let the answers pile up. There's a wide range of answers from all types of people. Some that were people that just started watching the series that were scared out of their mind from all the disappointed comments. But the two most frequently seen answers on this post were people saying season three, or season six. Naturally, I took the two most popular answers and made a poll. And the results had season three win by a whopping 70%. Now why? Why was this so polarizing and why was season three so seemingly hated? Oddly enough, a lot of people I talked to said that they fell off after season two, which is really odd to me because it seems to be the popular non-Voltron fan consensus. But from re-watching and talking to friends and fans of the show, there's a lot of different factors that played a part in the viewed decline of the show. For starters, all of the seasons are fucking short. I don't know why new shows do this. It's like a a new thing now. I could see if there was like a two or three episode difference, but some seasons are 13 episodes and others are like six, and they don't even warrant enough content to be a season long. Like, this ain't fully cooly, nigga. The pacing is still like regular episode pacing. For all that, I can wait a few months longer for everything to just be put in a normal season. It can be very annoying for some people, but there are not only technical changes to the show. Oh no, there are narrative ones too. In the finale of season two, Shiro goes missing after they fucked that nigga Zarkon up, and because of this, the team is in need of a new black paladin. What they 
they do in order to fix this is what many people refer to as the line switch. As I said earlier, Keith had to use the black line to save Shiro, so naturally he was the one to connect with the black line. That leaves the red line unusable, so the only one worthy of using the red line was naturally his boyfriend Lance. And a lot of people didn't exactly like this. But if you're me and know that Voltron in general has always done line switches, then you kind of expected it like me. And quite literally almost the same order. Don't get me wrong, it's confusing as hell, but it's nothing new under the sun. The original Voltron, if anything, started with the team in different lines for like no reason. I don't like Lance in red, that shit was weird as fuck, but I digress. The real kicker is not the fact that it was even done. It's that they kind of sort of do it a few more times throughout the series. There is one big switch from here on out until later though, and that's the introduction of Lotor. Oh, what a hottie that broke my fucking heart. And his colorful group of henchwomen, generals, evil niggas. That changes the occasional Hagar sends the monster of the week status quo to instead him quite literally going after them himself. Unfortunately, Hunk and Pidge don't really get much this season, and Hunk's development comes when he faces an arc literally at the tail end of the show. Since Alora is a paladin now, she has a more hands-on responsibility, which makes her feel more content honoring her father. Lance last season was already having a bit of an identity crisis, with not feeling like an adequate member of the team with the role. Seemingly in one episode last season, he proves himself to be the cool ninja sharpshooter that he is, but that's kind of undone seeing as when the black line accepts Keith and not him, he feels like he's not even fit to be a paladin. His boyfriend definitely reassured him though. Also, Keith is like a terrible leader for like two episodes and then gets an insane learning curve only for Shiro to be put back in the game, which is literally in the next season. The showrunners just planned on killing Shiro off like in the original, but he was liked enough that they brought him back. But like as a clone of the original Shiro that actually did die, which admittedly wasn't really well put together. He just kind of comes back right after the team starts to get used to working without him, which is really awkward. And after making Keith the kind of good leader, they just reverse it and make him a bad one again. And then he just leaves later on. This season also introduces the existence of alternate realities, which complicates things even more. And probably was one of the worst moves the show made, seeing as it resulted in the ending that we got. But we do get Sven in this nice reference to Voltron 84. <sighs> That'll be fine. Just got me to space hospital. This is the joke. We also get a backstory on how the lines were created and how Zarkon and Witch Bitch turned evil, which put it in a more logical and less Saturday morning cartoon-esque explanation, which would be none and that they're evil because why not? Honestly, even with all the shaky business that happens in season three, I can't agree that it's where the decline started. I for real still felt that good fresh vibe from these episodes. I can say the same for season four as well. Gotta go. <laughs> This season starts off with Keith officially leaving the team to work with the Blades while Shiro reclaims his leadership of the team. A lot of people say that this was rushed and the pacing was off and I really can't agree. I've been on the verge of tears with almost every emotional moment of this show but this was the first thing to actually make me cry when rewatching. It actually felt like a moving moment to me. But that doesn't mean that I liked it per se. Like at all. I hated it. He basically kicked himself off in order to get more in touch with his goal and roots but I'm pretty sure he could have done that either way. He didn't need to leave the team. It just more further makes thing is confusing. Why make him take over only to bring Shiro back? When you shake up a status quo, generally it's expected that you have a new one, but there's no new status quo. Things just keep changing. Either way, my eyes weren't done crying at all yet. Next, we finally get a Pidge episode in development when she finally finds her brother Matt after thinking he was long dead. See, through these four to five seasons, that's been Pidge's driving reasoning for fighting the good fight along with actually caring about defending the universe. But now that she finds her brother, they just look for her dad later on and when they find him, that's kind of where her arc stops and they don't do much with her anymore. So that kind of sucks. Also, Zarkon's brought back and Lotor's put on a back burner, only to be murdered next season and having Lotor reclaim the throne. So that was pretty unnecessary. Remember when I said Zarkon wasn't going anywhere? That was true, but also not true, because he comes back just to die in the next few episodes. Again, altering the status quo, but not having a new status quo. My favorite part of season four is the episode that involves them putting on a show for the galaxy in order to spread the message of Voltron and the legend, because you know, you don't just become defender of the universe overnight. It's filled with meta humor. Except for you, Shiro. I'll never get rid of you. You're our most popular character. Get it? Because they couldn't kill him off? Nothing else crazy happens besides Lotor joining Voltron in the next season, which is why I feel that season four and five should have been put together and not two separate seasons. In season five, we get more eventful shit like Keith meeting his mother, Lotor helping Voltron like I said, and we get that whole unnecessary Shiro clone arc searing his head in a bit. Also, we finally get a Lance episode. In this episode, he unlocks a sword that never seriously comes into play like it's presented to. This is 
just kind of meh. They did a good fucking thing. A really good, cool thing for Lance. They even give him a really cool moment in this episode. But this sword, this fucking sword, why give him such a cool upgrade that he literally did nothing of importance with? He only uses it literally one other time in season eight, and that's literally it. If you blink, you can miss it. I missed it the first time watching the show. It's so frustrating being a Lance fan sometimes. It's Jalance 2020 for God's sake. It only gets worse for him. Starting in season six. <laughs> Over the course of season 5, we seem to get what's seen as a sort of redemption arc for Lotor, as it's believed that he's trying to actually do good with the Garwin people, and the team slowly begins to trust him and so does the audience. We're kind of supposed to believe that he was on some Zuko shit. You know, evil dad belonging to a dominant tyrannical empire, joining the freedom fighters and forging his own destiny type shit. I'm pretty sure that's what was supposed to happen. And it seemed like a fine direction to take considering Lotor straight up calls Alora out, and by proxy the audience are having preconceived negative feelings towards Lotor because of his Garwin lineage. So you think that by providing this perspective, they do something akin to a redemption arc. But then they pull the most unnecessarily complicated and irredeemable twist for him ever. He apparently enslaved and murdered thousands of Altains for thousands of years. Meaning there are more of them in that, you know, he's an actual fucking monster. It's a terrible day for rain and thunder. Fucking Lotor, you did this shit. Even in context, his crewmates say that his intentions are convoluted and confusing, which is even more true in season 8 when we get flashbacks of him actually being a good person and trying to work with other races for the Empire. So they just genuinely did not know what to do with him. Not only is this astronomically dumb, but they also start and confirm Lotora. Literally, when the twist happens, a complete waste of a ship. Not only that, but literally during and right after, they finally decide that they want Lawrence to be a thing. More than five seasons completed. It took this nigga literally almost dying and our meister here is qualms for her to give a shit about this nigga in literally any other way specifically. Still though, there are very redeeming qualities of this season and it ain't the dumpster fire that people say it is despite certain things. In my opinion, the addition of Ramel is actually pretty cool. She's a fresh new character and I love her a lot. Also as a casual D&D fan, I love the monsters and mana episodes so much. All of the paladins have really funny moments. Not only that, but we get to learn more about Keith's family and he gets to bond with his mom more. That and we get Cosmo the wolf. My dog's name is also Cosmo. Cosmo, how do you feel about the complex, nuanced storytelling of Voltron? You thinking about it? Think, thinking long and hard? I'll wait. But, uh, they kill Lotor off, resolve the confusing Shiro clone arc, and change his design for the third time in a row. And then they make a decision I used to actually not be a fan of. For season 7, they decide to go home. I don't hate it anymore while rewatching, and I honestly think it's a healthy change in pace. They've been traveling the galaxy for hell knows how long. A good change in pace is needed. <laughs> Please give me money. Also follow my social media. Also join the Discord server. It's pretty fun. Now with shameless plugs out of the way, I'm finna talk about season seven. Here we go. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a. I don't give a. I don't give a fuck. Now they have to go home because they got rid of the castle for plot reasons. And in the process, the writers handicapped the team in more ways than one. For the second half of season seven, they established a new status quo. They're grounded on Earth. The first half was them realizing just how fucked they are. Earth's taken over by Gaara. Most of the blades were killed by them druid niggas. The Gaara themselves are in shambles considering that Lotor and Zarkon are dead and Nerva does not give a single fuck about these niggas. And the witch bitch is out of the picture doing our own unimportant plot shit for next season. Now I wanted to know more about the garrison, but not at the hand of the team being handicapped. A shitty new character. And oh yeah, queer bait. Y'all already heard that from me though. I honestly don't like Adam, but I probably would if we got more than just a flashback and a death scene. Honestly though, fuck this bitch. She literally only exists to make contrasting orders and to give our heroes adversity. Like she sells these niggas out in order to try to make a deal with Sindak. Why negotiate with an alien warlord that you know for a fact don't give a shit about your civilization? Why betray your niggas? I mean, she dies anyways, but why betray your niggas? And we're supposed to feel bad for her dying. It's supposed to be a sad moment, but like, I don't give a fuck. I'm glad you're dead. You exist only as a detriment. Don't even let me forget to mention that this season takes place after a time skip. And it's not an everyone time skip. It's just the rest of the world and not the paladins. This is because of some freaky wormhole stuff. They also do the stupid cop-out thing at the end where we're supposed to believe that the paladins died. I'm just 
tired. But I do in fact see very redeeming qualities to season 7, such as seeing the very adorable baby Keith and Big Brother Shiro moments, more moments with Keith and Hunk that we haven't had in a few seasons, Sendak honestly, especially his rematch with Shiro, seeing as he isn't just a puppet for all this third party quintessence shit, you know like he actually has a goal for the Gara. this nigga wanna fuck shit up. Hunk actually getting his arc like I said earlier, involving him finding his family and the team recognizing just how important he is to Voltron, the second episode was also pretty funny, with them setting up seating and whatnot. also seeing these niggas again as space pirates was really cool, and I don't, I don't wanna like 100% say that they're gay, but like these niggas are gay, a much better route that could have been officially taken, I mean lesbians won in the end after all anyways, the bag was fumbled, we also get the new garrison squad, these characters are great honestly, and they exist to make sure non-paladins aren't useless at all in the fight for the universe, my favorite is honestly Kincaid, that and freckle girl, bless them all, also the game show episode is really fucking funny, something about seeing these niggas act all nonchalant is extremely hilarious, biggest negative in my opinion, a Lawrence, forced garbage that we get to see more of in season 8, honestly like I said, Lance gets fucked up probably the worst out of all in this, he gets validation and a new power up that he never uses, and he gets the girl that he wants only after she gets with someone else and leaves him because he's evil, Lance is the second choice, and I felt the writers honestly could have done something with that. Maybe you can put in a good word for me with that long haired friend of yours, hmm? What? Keith? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, way, no. In other words, keep your hands off my man, bitch. Obviously, though, whatever the original intentions for Lance have been long lost to the sands of time, and that is objectively disappointing. But as you know, that surely ain't far from it. We got one more season to talk about. <laughs> In season 8, they go back to space to resolve loose ends, and focus on a weak ass overarching plot with the witch bitch. At the end of season 7, witch bitch sent an Altain robot to almost wipe the floor with Voltron, if not for the unnecessarily thick atlas that was able to transform into a robot. Just look at them thighs. Baby girl is thick. These niggas still believe that Lotor is good, and since Voltron iced his ass, they believe that Voltron is evil, which obviously isn't the case. This Zero Two looking ass nigga. The Voltron coalition at this point are trying to figure out why she's fucking shit up and you know, taking all the quintessence out of specific planets of interest having them being destroyed but before we get into the pretty avoidable bad ending i'm gonna yet again tell you all of the meat and then the extremely well deserved positives of the season because i'm not gonna pretend like all this is bad in the first half of the season we get a nerva having some flashback development the team finally convincing agora to team up with them seeing as they all now have a common enemy and pitch dealing with the destruction of the alcarion planet that taught her more what she needed to know technology wise that and them trying to scrap with the nerva in episode six but it failing after she deadass put a laura in a genjutsu like what the hell is this honestly for as much as I hate a Lawrence and how forced it is, I can't lie and say I wasn't moved by the wholesome moments they shared. That and the launch date episode was an actually good episode. I like how in this show, the original incarnation of Voltron is seen as a fictional TV show. It's very funny. I also love the episode that involves auction Veronica bonding. She talks about how uneasy it is for her to fit in, but Veronica lets her know that she just thinks she needs a friend and that her past doesn't define her future. There's that and Zethrid having to realize that all this rogue shit is lame as hell, seeing as their lives have been affected negatively all in service for the Gaur and specifically Lotor. Like, Ezra don't fuck with it, and you shouldn't too. Also, these niggas are gay. Ah, oh, good job, Keith. I mean, I was just about to do that too, but... Yeah, you can! Use your sword! Episode 7, Day 47 is actually a pretty great episode, and it's probably my favorite episode of the season. It's a King Cade focused episode about life on the Atlas, and it involves a great amount of entertaining character moments. They do the Chronicle thing where the whole episode is through one in-universe camera, and then other in-universe cameras. My second favorite episode was the literal next one after Day 47. The Clear Day episode is a callback to a Season 4 episode, and it involves the Paladins and Atlas crew minus Alora hanging out on Clear Day and having a little fun moments. There's more Keith and Hunk, and Shiro gets to arm wrestle an old enemy turned friend. Alora, on the other hand, has to deal with more fake illusions of Lance and Lotor because of this, uh, entity. They say it a lot. In the next episode, they use that thing to track witch bitch down, and in the process, end up in her mind, but also space? I don't know, it's kind of confusing. But they fight and meet the old paladins, and they help them team up in her mind to find out exactly what she's been trying to do this whole time. The last three episodes, though, are where we get to see what she wanted to come into reality. Or as I guess I should say, multiple realities. The last three episodes involved the crew taking a fight to Hanerva, seemingly losing, which lets her get what she wants, but she soon finds out that you kinda can't just slide into realities and replace the dead counterpart of yourself from an alternate reality with people instantly accepting it, without, you know, being a little bit sus about it, but out of nowhere because this doesn't work out, she says fuck it. It wants to literally destroy all of reality for no reason, and like a, if I can't have what I want, no one can type of thing, but as almost as instantly as she went full on fuck it, she's defeated and quite literally talked no jutsu into writing her wrong. 
songs. I know I keep joking about Naruto shit, but this scene literally looks like that scene when Naruto talking with Jutsu to Obito. But just like that, Alora and Nerva sacrifice themselves to fix all fabrics of reality with their Altaian powers. So yeah, Lance can't have shit. Now I'm pretty sure there could have been plenty of easy ways they could have written this, even with this direction that lead to Alora not being dead. But that's what happened, and I accept it. Although better moves could have definitely been made, this is how they chose to end it. With the Paladins continuing life in their respective fields and keeping close contact as one could only imagine. Except Lance. He's a farmer for some reason, and Shiro marries some other guy. I guess Curtis is fine. Kinda weird, but he's cool. Hey look, they get brawny points for showing the on-screen gay kiss. I'm joking. They don't. With that said, we've reached the end of Voltron. You okay? I'm good, bro. You gay again, bro. I'm good. Bro, bro. Bro, get off me. I'm good, bro. I'm not gonna lie and pretend like this wasn't a very emotional journey. For as upbeat and humorous as I've tried my best to keep it, I've definitely cried quite a lot, especially at the ending. Like I said in the beginning, VOD had a huge impact on me and came at a really impactful time of my life. My love for this show honestly outweighs the love for any other show. This was the first real fandom I got into. The first real animated property I was so deeply submerged into. I grew older with the Paladins and they grew older with me. Even if it wasn't too 100% of my liking. So was Voltron bad? Although there are objectively parts where the Voltron Voltron stopped dropped the ball. The show itself collectively isn't bad. At all. Truthfully, I didn't know the answer until the end of this very video. I can say like a lot of people, I was blinded by a naturally animalistic fandom hate. It doesn't get bad after season 2, season 6, or even season 7. There's a lot of good in literally every season. Going back and taking a look at the show as a whole for me was quite the journey, but an educational one at that. If anything, rewatching the ending, I cried probably 10 times as much more than I did the first time, which was almost barely any tears at all. Seeing as Voltron was one of the first things I've talked about when I first made this channel, I can say it came all full circle for me. This was me revisiting my roots. Words simply cannot describe just how much this show means to me. And rewatching it and making this video just felt like a thing I had to do. It only felt natural. So with a heart full of vigor and full of passion, I thank you for watching. All that's left to say is to remember to piss on Dobermans. Thank you for going on this journey with me of revisiting something that means a lot to me. And later, Palo dudes, you got a universe to defend.